Hi, everyone. Welcome to Cabrillo National Monument. My name is Ranger Amanda. I've worked here for about 15 years. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. I have done a lot with the Maritime Museum of San Diego. We have a great partnership with them. Um, and today, Dr. Ray Ashley is going to give a presentation about the building of the San Salvador. But before we get to that, a little bit about uh, Dr. Ray Ashley. He is the president and CEO of the Maritime Museum of San Diego. He grew up locally and became the director of the Maritime Museum in 1995. He holds a BA in anthropology from UCSD, an MA in maritime history from uh, East Carolina University, and a PhD in history from Duke University. Go Blue Devils. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's going to give a presentation again about our partnership and the building of the San Salvador. We would ask that since this is a hybrid presentation, we have about 70 people joining us on Zoom. Hi, everyone in the camera. Uh, we ask that you hold your questions until the end. Hold your questions until the end. We'll have a Q&A where we will bounce back between um, in-person and virtual questions being asked. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Ray Ashley. I figured out how to make this work. <laughs> so uh, well, thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me here to speak to this group. And uh, it's always nice to stock a room with my friends from the Maritime Museum. So if you're from the Maritime Museum, just raise your hand. Right, right. So now the next time I come here, everybody's going to have that hand up, right? Because they're all going to want to join the Maritime Museum. So, um, so as as Ranger Amanda said, I'm going to be talking about the uh, the San Salvador, a bit about building it, but a little, a little bit about the background of Cabrillo himself, which those of you from Cabrillo National Monument already know a lot of, and um, um, what we've done with the San Salvador since. But what I'm also going to try to do. Uh, is trying to interweave that story with maybe a larger picture and try to put the, that voyage and this whole phenomenon in the context of uh, a larger uh, unfolding of science and rationalism and so forth, which is appropriate because as you drive up the hill, you can see all these, this, this huge city laid out before you. There's three universities. It's, it's a major science center in the United States. And uh, of course, about 25% of the Navy is here also. So none of this was here. In 1542, and it would have been unimaginable that it would be. But it, it how that all unfolded, in a way, kind of has its origins with some of the things we're going to be talking about, or I'm going to be talking about uh, in this talk. So um, I say it's discovering the San Salvador. I really need to change the name because people think it's an archaeological expedition to try and find it, and that's not going to happen. So uh, here's here's our place, the Maritime Museum, located down the hill. It's kind of an ideal form. We don't have quite the same ships that we used to have. That Russian submarine is gone, thank goodness, because it was before you know everything happened in Ukraine, and that would have been a pretty unfortunate symbol to be connected to. But nonetheless, what we try to do is we try to use our ships to tell stories as a narrative form. We had our origins with the San Diego Zoo when they got the when they acquired the San Diego in 1927. We were part of the Zoological Society, and indeed, in many respects, we are more like a zoo than like a normal museum because the ships there are like living things and they have to be cared for almost like animals in the zoo. And, um, and many of them are, are, are otherwise would be extinct you know, or face extinction. So we're, we're much more like that. And so our ships tend to be active and, 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 and interactive in the way that we use them to tell these stories. And there's a kind of an underlying principle that underlies all of our exhibits and, and our educational programs and the stories we tell. And that was simply this that the world we live in was not inevitable. Now that seems obvious, that's not gonna be a hard sell, but if you think about it, uh, the role of history is to explain why things happen the way they did. And when you have it presented to you, as all of us do in history classes and in school and then in college, um, once you go into enormous detail and careful explain, explanation for why things happened the way they did, from our perspective, it appears as though they could have happened any other way. So there's this air of inevitability attached to it that makes it seem like we're all sort of here uh, acting according to a script written by someone else, uh, motivated by forces beyond our control. And that's the perspective of looking backwards in time. But, you know, 
for us in the moment as it was for any of these people in their moment. No one knew how it was going to turn out. And indeed, it could have gone any way, any, any number of ways. And in fact, the, often the, the path taken that our that history has taken has been one that we never could have predicted. And understanding that and, and invoking that in, in stories helps, it, it's kind of empowering because it makes us all realize that you know the history of the future isn't written yet, and it's ours to make what it is, and um, and it's our responsibility to also. So we try to make that in all of these stories, and indeed this one as well. And this one stories about this guy, you know, after whom this place is named. Do we know that he looked that way? Uh, no, we can really have no idea if he looked that way or he looked like that. And there is here in the in the in the exhibit in the exhibits area um, gallery a uh, headstone that or it might be a headstone. It was found on Santa Rosa Island in 1902. Some people think it might be the headstone for Cabrillo. Many other people think it's a fraud. We have a copy of the fraud, or a silly fraud, if that's the case, in our museum as well. Um, right outside, there is this statue uh, to this guy uh, where he's staring boldly to the, to the west. You go to Balboa Park, you see statues of him there everywhere. Uh, and on the, one of the westernmost pieces of land off the California coast on San Miguel Island, there is this cross erected by the Portuguese society back in the 1920s uh, to Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo, in this case, given a Portuguese spelling. In fact, if you go on to the internet, you can lose yourself for hours with all the things named Cabrillo. There are millions of things, you know, schools and launch ramps and parks and hospitals and uh, dance academies and just, there are lots of things. In fact, there are about 1.2 million places with Cabrillo's name on them. It's one of the most popular place names in the country and certainly in California. So obviously this guy, whoever he was, was California's most famous tourist when he was here, but he only spent a few weeks of his life in California. So to have all your name, your name on all of these things, for a guy who only spent a few weeks here, especially since we don't really know what he looked like and we don't know exactly where he died. We kind of know how he died, but not precisely. We don't know where he's buried. Uh, the records of his voyage were lost, and uh, a lot of the, the deeds of his life were not recorded, although now we do know more about those than we used to, and we used to not even know until fairly recently where he was born, so now, now we have an idea of that, but, um, but not all that much because things were not recorded very well in those days, and, and of his ship, we don't even have an, a really uh, a picture of what it looked like, much less a set of plans or anything else, so th this all of this is shrouded in the mist of time, and we try to, to um, penetrate through that. And it's helpful to actually look at the world that existed in people's minds before Cabrillo and understand the world he was born into. And there's different renderings of that world. And this is one of the most famous of them. This is called the Hereford map. It was uh, constructed about the year 1300. And it's, it's in the Hereford Cathedral in England. And it is one of the largest and most beautiful and um, elaborate of what are called T-O maps. And they're called that because it's the image of, of a T inside of an O depicting the world. You can see it a little bit more schematically in this map here from 1472. Uh, this map, the Isidorian T-O map is actually, a copy of this is actually in the map museum in Buffalo Boy. If you want to go look at one, a map of the world that's 500 years old. And what characterizes them is that Asia is at the top, Europe is at the lower left corner, and Africa's a little right corner, and it is supposed to be the shape of a cross. And east is up because that was the direction of the Garden of Eden from people in Europe, so they believed. And um, it was the shape of a cross because there was this belief that creation and the world and the universe was an augury of the Christian story, that everything that had ever happened and that everything that ever would happen could be divine if you understood the geography completely. And the clues to that God had left for all of us, so we believe, in the geography that we created. So simple one on the left, pretty complicated one on the right, but they have commonalities. So again, Asia at the top, the center is Jerusalem, right? Center of the Christian story. And this thing coming down is the Mediterranean, and uh, the exit of which is was called the Pillars of Hercules. It's now called the Straits of Gibraltar. And that ends up working in the iconography that we use every day because um, the symbol uh, between the new world and the old ended up becoming that dividing line in the, in the, 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 the Straits of Her the, the Gibraltar, the Pillars of Hercules. And you have these two vertical, vertical lines 
and then the new world on top and the old world on the bottom are reversed in the two lines through them. Well, schematically, okay, you see that in the seal of the city of San Diego later, but it also is the symbol for the dollar sign, right? The, 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 the colors of Hercules. So we continue to sort of resuscitate these, this imagery, and it, it is a period in places we don't even expect it. In this elaborate map, uh, you can see the upper right is the Red Sea, the color of red. It looks kind of like an impacted tooth in a way. And the smiley face to the right, that is the entire Indian Ocean because it was believed by most geographers to have been a closed sea. Uh, Herodotus said so. He just believed um, the story of Phoenician seafarers who sailed out through the flows of Hercules, around through uh, down below the uh, Africa and into the Indian Ocean. He said, well, that's just nonsense. That could have happened. And we know it's fantasy because these guys recorded that the sun rose to the north of them, you know, after the after the equinox, and that's that's patently impossible. Well, of course, we know that is exactly what happens when you cross the equator. So for us, that would be validation that Phoenicians did this. But to Herodotus, no, close sea, that's what they believed it was, because you know, it doesn't Indian Ocean doesn't have very big tides, just like the um, just like the Mediterranean doesn't. Uh, and as you go from the middle out to the edges. Okay, you get more and more towards this ocean that surrounds the earth. And I'm going to just pitch it in a way where we're kind of more used to seeing it, I guess, um, with Europe and Africa and Asia. And as you get to the, to, out to the far reaches, um, what also happens is that the, the, the societies and civilizations you encounter get stranger, more bizarre. People get more primitive and savage. Animals get scarier and more monstrous. You know, they don't. California doesn't even appear on this map, so you can figure out what it's on about. But in any case, out towards the edges, out towards the edges is where the problems lie. And there, these maps occurred in a lot of forms. Here's another one from 1109, and you can see the Garden of Eden, east is up, Mediterranean, the Red Sea on the right. And look at this line of fishes that goes around here because that is Mare Oceanus. So I'm going to back it up just a little bit. And Mare Oceanus is not the ocean we see out here from Cabrillo National Monument. It's the sea that surrounds the earth, but it's also in this map and in belief of the time, the dividing line between this world and the next. And if you cross it back, you weren't going to come back because you're going into the afterworld, right? And there was a lot of evidence that that was exactly what would happen. Uh, there were expeditions that disappeared by sailing, trying to sail over it. The most famous was up here in Genoese brothers called the Lombardo brothers, who sailed out the Pillar of Hercules in uh, 1348. They had an expedition financed and equipped for a three-year voyage to try and see if they could get into the Indian Ocean. They sailed out, never heard from again. And that was a fairly typical story. So scary things out there. And you can see in, the, in this map, particularly, you can see the fish are the symbols of eternity or of death. So when you cross that line, you're not coming back. Here's another version of a TO map. Uh, this one uh, in the 13th century. Uh, similar things, except what's interesting about this one is uh, instead of implying that bizarre things were out on the edge, you actually see, if you look at the lower right, a beast Jeremy with crazy, bizarre creatures on it that you, you, know, you wouldn't want to encounter. And indeed, out there, there were things like, you know, there's a beast here from 1492 that shows um, uh, a, a, some guy with six arms, so they had seen an Indian god Vishnu, I guess, uh, a guy without a head but a face on his chest, uh, a guy that only had one leg, but he had a giant foot that he hopped around on. And uh, all kinds of creatures. There was a belief that giants existed at the far reaches, and indeed, it was believed until the 18th century that a race of giants lived in Patagonia uh, in South America. And indeed, there's some skeletons of really large people that had been found not too long ago. And there were stories of encounters of what ha would happen when people went out to sea. Like this one in the upper left is a story from the book of St. Brendan, the navigator, the uh, sixth century Irish monk who some people believe sailed a leather boat across the Atlantic. He and his fellow monks were sailing along. They saw an island, time to hold mass. They pull up on the island, pull their boat up, get out all of the mass stuff, the mass kit, and uh, start to go, start to have a really uh, certain ceremony. And suddenly the island comes alive because they landed on a whale. But it's not just any whale. This particular whale was really well read and debated the monks on the finer points of Christian dogma while they were doing it. So all kinds of interesting things. And indeed, it was believed that the ocean was inhabited by frightening and terrifying things. We have a sea monster exhibit at the Maritime Museum now that, that draws upon this whole sense. And in this image done by a German cartographer, 
Um, you can see there's a, a whaling ship up there. They're actually throwing their barrels of whale oil overboard to try and placate the really irritated whales. They're about to sink their ship. They're doing their gigantic lobsters, sea monsters. They're these sea serpents wrapping themselves around. All of this is really scary. Um, but the upper part of it, though, is very normal and placid. It's it's on the land, and it's where people are, you know, raising their crops and, and harvesting them and so forth. And the message of this is, this could happen to you. Don't go there. And, and, and if it wasn't bad enough for the, for the bad, an awful, terrifying creature, uh, there was also all these superstitions that believed that the oceans were also inhabited by scary and evil supernatural forces. Uh, and, and those are all kind of evoked really well in Coleridge's, many years later, Coleridge, Coleridge's Brian H. Mariner. Well, um, so you would not have thought that the society that produced this and had this kind of impression of the ocean was one that would develop uh, a revolutionary technology of, of the first of its kind in human history that was capable of navigating it across oceans and basically making the people who built these things, these ships, the economic masters of almost the entire world. You would have picked someone else, and indeed, you would have you would have gone around the world, and, and the, the Europeans were the last ones you would have picked them, because he, even they thought that they were going on the downward spiral that was not recoverable. Uh, I cannot persuade myself that there's anything good in prospect. That was how Pope Pius II started uh, an address, sort of the state of Christendom, where the, the moral or the themes were just all in a black troll. And indeed, uh, in the 14th century. Uh, in the start beginning and, and several waves of plague had washed across Europe, killing the first round, somewhere around 40% of the entire European population. And Europe was also beset by the Ottomans, the rising power of the Ottoman Empire in the East. And um, it was just, they, they thought they were being pushed into a corner along the way out. So you would have picked other societies to actually develop maritime technology like China, which had been the wealthiest country on earth for the previous 20 centuries. And they uh, had a uh, sophisticated maritime culture and indeed sent these giant treasure fleets all throughout the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean. Uh, seven of these massive voyages organized by the, um, by the Islamic Chinese Admiral Zheng He, uh, sailing these ships, large ships, all, uh, many as a, as a thousand at one time all over the world until they determined that, well, you know, every place we find, they're not as advanced as China, so they're no reason they're not very interesting so we'll just ignore those guys uh and the chinese then turned inward uh you might have picked the um might pick the polynesians because only about only about 500 years before this they completed their colonization of almost the entire pacific ocean uh, a society that spread themselves over the largest cultural area occupied by a single culture on the middle all speaking the same language all with an extremely sophisticated system of navigation that nonetheless did not rely on, they did not, they didn't have metallurgy, they didn't have mathematics the way we have it, they didn't even have a written language, and they didn't understand, they didn't depict space or understand it in the way we do, at, like with a map as, a, as an absolute frame of reference. It was a variable or moving frame of reference, but it wasn't them. And you might have certainly picked the, the uh, Islamic world because they had the most sophisticated maritime technology at the time. They were advancing, and they were also um, highly intellectual based and science based by comparison with everyone else, and um, but had a rational worldview. So this is a map, as opposed to what I showed you earlier, produced by the Islamic cartel in Greece. Uh, for uh, Roger of Sicily, Sicily was a Norman Viking kingdom in the 12th century, but it was very cosmopolitan, or people from all different cultures there, and. Uh, uh, this this was a, an Arab philosopher and cartographer who depicted what was what the, the Arab world thought of as the world, and it of course is is the east up, and so we're turning it I'm turning it the normal way. And you can see there's lines of latitude. There's the Nile River. There's the Indian Ocean. Is an open sea. There's the Mediterranean. It all looks much more like what we think of looking at that part of the globe. And and there's no story. There's no religious message here. That it's not an augury of the Christian story. It's a rational depiction of space. So you would think, well, that would be the society that would be the most advanced and rational and science-based, and it would be the Europeans who, by comparison, were, were divided and fractious and violent and fundamentalist and, um, and superstitious and, and, and feeling like their, their whole society was being marginalized and had 
descendant from its, its better days and best days. Now, that seems to almost have reversed itself. You know, if you think of our relationship now in the West, in the Islamic world. And so these upheavals, giant upheavals of culture, don't happen very often, and they're always very mysterious to historians when they do. And for a long time, historians have been at a loss, really. <laughs> Look at this gigantic change where two societies kind of changed places and explain it. And many of them, going all the way back to the 30s, draw upon one thing at the beginning of the early modern era that changed all that, and that was these things, uh, the oceanic sailing ship. Because even despite those voyages of Shenkha, his ships could not have done what these European ships uh, uh, only a little bit later, you know, only a few years later could do. They could sail across oceans or around the world. Uh, they could weather storms. They could sail in light airs. Uh, and they, not only that, but they could destroy any other kind of ship they found if they were found them as an adversary because they had seaborne artillery, which no Chinese ships had. Uh, that was beginning fairly early on. This is the earliest depiction I know of, of a cannon. Uh, it's Chinese, but they worked their way onto European ships and turned the ships themselves into weapons. The other thing that was really powerful for Europeans is that they had a system of navigation that could not only get you there and back, but you could draw a map, and on that map, you could claim uh, that a territory was yours. And other societies didn't really do that. They didn't depict space rationally, and they didn't use it so much to, de to define property. Mm -hmm. That's what the Europeans did, and that may have been the most powerful tool they had um, at, at their disposal. Now, there understanding of the world uh, wasn't always like the TO chart. Going back to uh, Greek and Roman times, some were a little more sophisticated. Now this again, it's not a TO chart, but again, it shows the Indian Ocean as a closed sea, and it shows latitude and longitude, so this is more rational. But it shows directions as a matter of the directions of the winds. This is particularly true in the Mediterranean, where the winds were given names, so you could tell the direction you were sailing based upon the quality of the wind. Was it hot and dry? Was it warm? And Moist, was it cold and wet? You know, uh, Sirocco, Levanters, there's a whole lot of names for these. And that's pretty much how sailors determine direction by these swell patterns of the winds. But beginning in the, um, in the uh, 13th century, Europeans started to do something else which no one had done before. The compass was invented in China. It migrated from China through the Arab world to Europe, but they didn't use it for navigation. The Chinese used the compass for feng shui kinds of things, orienting houses and things. The Europeans got a hold of it and they began to use it to navigate with. And what's interesting about this is that the compass is the first instrument I know of ever, ever invented that measures a quality of nature we can't actually sense. You know, thermometers, you can look at, it rationalizes its degrees, hot and cold, but you can feel hot and cold. Rulers, you can measure things, but you can measure them with your arm span or your, your feet or whatever. Um, uh, angles and elevation you could you could see you, you may have an instrument that defines it precisely but you can see what that is all these qualities of nature you can see with your own senses um and indeed aristotle said if you can't see it with your senses it has no part being part of science instruments only will ever get in the way of a proper scientific analysis but the compass measured something to determine direction and no one knew what the heck it was uh, it wasn't until the 16th century and when he even wrote a book about magnetism, and even Gilbert, who did so uh, in his work on the magnet, didn't really know what it was. But you could use it to define direction. And what is interesting is that the compass gets into Europe about 1200. Within 70 years, this map is produced. It's the first rational depiction of space we have. It's called the Carte de And it, it's the map of the Mediterranean, and everything on it is shown in absolute reference, right, and to scale. And there were no European maps that did this before then. Everything was based upon size, might have been the importance of the wealth of the society, or they just, they, this was, this is what a view of the world from a viewpoint no one could have had because it would have been elevated like a view from space. The people just didn't envision, you know, space that way and crossing it. And from this point on, that process of navigation begins to insert itself into the worldview that people had. And gradually you start to see impressions of the world chain from that vision where it's an augury of the Christian story to something a lot more logical and rational. And you can see this in the, in the um, evolution of the depictions of space. So, uh, for instance, in the upper right and the lower left are what's called rudders or routiers. The 
the books of sailing directions and it's a narrative story. So if you turn on your GPS and you say, give me directions, it tells you, okay, on this, go down three streets and go for half a mile and turn right at the third traffic light. You're getting set directions of things to do in sequence, right? There's a narrative to it. And the thing about that is if you ever get out of whack, you got to go back to the start again. On the other hand, what you see in the upper left is a map from the bird's eye view in an absolute space, absolute sense of reference, where everything is absolutely relative to everything else. So it doesn't matter where you are on it, you can find where you are at any point relative to everything else. So that's a rational depiction of space, whereas the other two are narrative depictions of space. And ultimately, they evolved from this map here, which is from Wagner's Atlas of 1585 down to the lower right, which is the first uh, hydrographer of the Royal Navy, Granville Collins, who has produced this pretty rational depiction of the Sealy Islands, right, off the coast of England, uh, and one of the first modern rational maps. So in any case, you can see how that changes, and it changes because of the introduction of mathematics and instrumentation into, er into everyday practice. And navigation, engineering, and mining were, were the only three things at this time in which instruments and math mathematics played a major role. But with navigation, most of all, they were using it to find, to, to found empires and cross oceans. And it was up until then, probably, you know, mathematics was useful for a few people, but this is where it begins to be employed on a vast scale. And people were fascinated with, they were fascinated with these instruments. You can see over here, this is a whaling ship. It's kind of, uh, 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 it's kind of satirical because all these guys are down below. They're doing all their navigation, their instruments. They've got globes and binders and charts. And they don't even see the whale. They're not supposed to be catching off to the left because they're so obsessed with, with playing with their navigational toys, which, which they did. In this period, in the 16th century, most countries did all of the mathematics in Roman numerals. So this is a, a book of, of, of uh, declinations uh, by Martin Cortez from, from his book, Art de Navigar, of 1545. You can see all the degrees are all in Roman numerals. It, no zero. It was hard to do complex calculations compared to the way we do it. Gradually, though, that's those systems of navigation moved from an art, as you see there, over time to more rational and scientific depictions. It goes from an art to a system of navigation and understanding that it goes more from illustrations, more into equation. Okay, so this is a long process by which we're understanding our world in total rational terms. Well, that gets to be important when people start sailing across oceans and they start claiming territories. So this is probably the most important map to do that because that line coming right down from top to bottom was the line drawn by Pope Alexander VI in 1542. It actually, it's the line that's been moved a little bit to the west, 600 leagues west of the Azores by Pope Alexander VI when the Columbus discoveries became evident and when the Portuguese were at that point succeeding in the voyages around Africa in the Indian Ocean. And Alexander VI basically gave the entire world that was not already occupied, everywhere that was not occupied presently by any Christian king, he gave the entire world to the Spanish and the Portuguese. So everything to the right of that line, that belongs to Portugal. Spanish, don't go there. Everything to the left belongs to Spain. Portuguese, stay the hell out. You know, and, and, and all that world is, is yours, even though. At this moment, 25% of the world's population lived in the Americas and had been living there for thousands of years. Uh, 14 or 15 of the world's largest cities were in the Americas, right? Uh, it was millions of people, about 50 million people, yet automatically all their lands were owned by the Spanish, except for this bit to the right uh, that you see on South America. What was interesting about this map also is that line of demarcation, two things about it, that part of the right that carves off part of Brazil, or cars car, cars off Brazil, which is now where Portuguese is spoken, Brazil technically wasn't discovered until 1504. Obviously, people knew about it before it was before it got to be public. And um, the other thing about it is this is a first line showing property or possession drawn on any map that doesn't coincide with a river or sea coast or a mountain range. It's just a patch of ocean. And no one would know how to locate that precisely. Uh, you know, for more than 200 years after this. And yet the whole world's history basically was, was defined or determined by drawing that line. So it became part of the Spanish project to uh, find out what the contents of the world was and to map it all. And they began to create this uh, secret document called the uh, 
uh, the, the uh, carte de real, uh, or carte de control. This is a portion of it, the only, the largest portion known to exist. It was so secret, it's never been found, the actual complete document. But this is a portion of it. And it shows things as ships that are sailing, they're showing the prevailing winds. Okay, so they're not just decorative items, they're actually telling you what direction it was blowing in the Caribbean here in the East Coast of the Americas. Um, and so constructing that was a, was a big deal. And it began to be a big deal for the time Columbus sailed across the Atlantic. Columbus, of course, thought he had found the Indies. This is what the map was when, in his mind, and this is what the actual map is. And you can see that he would have thought the Americas were just a, a nuisance in the way where he was trying to go. And he refused to believe that it was a whole new place that no one ever knew about. But pretty soon, every, everyone began to realize that, that in North, in North and South America were between Europe and the Indies, the two sailed west. And it was too cold and icy to go north, of, north around. And um, when Magellan tried to go south around, that turned out not to work out well for him. He left Spain, uh, San Luca de Bermuda, with five ships and 215 men. 19 men made it back alive from one ship. So that's not a pretty, that's not a good record for one name to repeat. You know? uh, and, but that one ship, the Victoria, came back with enough spices to pay for the whole thing. So A, it was really hard to get to the Indies. On the other hand, you could make a lot of money to figure out how to get there. So we see Columbus's voyage on this chart and then Magellan's route around the world. Of course, Magellan died in the Philippines. He never made it the rest of the way around, but the Spanish did. So it also suggests that the Pacific is much bigger and more complex than anyone imagined. It's not, you know, the little place right here, but, you know, it's not just the extension of the Atlantic. The thing is huge and it's complex. This is just a snapshot of from uh, earth.millschool.net uh, of just a moment in time. And you can see the winds are all over the place. It's difficult to discern and they had to figure it out. Now, Magellan attempted it and it did work. One of his ships attempted to get back across the Pacific by sailing east and it did it. It, had, it went back to the Philippines, never made it out. Following Magellan, a voyage by a guy named Lhasa, um, sailed, uh, followed his route and sailed through his straits. And one ship ended up going to New Spain, to west coast of Mexico. One ship went to the Philippines, where it met up with Magellan's survivors, some of them. And another one disappeared. No one knows, knew until recently where it went, but early 16th century Spanish material culture had been found in Hawaii. So people believe that that last alien may have gone to, or Caravelle may have gone to Hawaii. And, and there, the Spaniards just got absorbed in the Hawaiian population or killed or whatever it was, but that's where they ended up. But they couldn't get, find a way to get back. Um, they tried. So, so they addressed, sailed across the Pacific and tried to get back. Tried to go south, didn't make it. Tried to go, go north, didn't make it. Nobody could figure out a way how to get back across the Pacific. And until someone figured that out, you may have the Americas, and they, they were at first they were in the way, but then they found out that they're full of gold and also that huge amounts of silver. So the Spanish got the wherewithal to be able to trade with China, but they just needed to be able to get there and get back again. Uh, Cortez attempted it. Cortez actually discovered California all on his own. Well, not quite. A group of pirates grabbed one of his ships and sailed to the Northwest and discovered the tip of Baja, California, and reported that the place was full of pearls. They sailed back, were arrested, and then Cortez went back and found Baja, California, but didn't find that much in the way of pearls. But that was the first try to get to the Northwest and see if you could find a coastwise route that you could follow the coastline all along the shore and get to China that way. And at some point, far to the north, the Americas and Asia might join. So um, an expedition under a guy named Francisco de Ulloa left in 1539 from Acapulco, went up the coast of New Spain, the west coast of New Spain, all the way up to about the latitude of Cabo San Lucas or La Paz, sailed over to La Paz. He had three ships, which was typical, a big one and a couple small ones. He sailed over to La Paz, back over to the, um, to the mainland shoreline and worked his way slowly up to the head of the, what well, was even then called the Sea of Cortez, because Cortez had discovered it and found this enormous river just shoving lots of fresh water out in the head of the Gulf. It was red and thought, well, it's like the Red Sea, you know, God really was trying to make things symmetrical here. And that's why it's called the Colorado River. 
And then, but he couldn't get up. They thought maybe that was leading a route back to the Atlantic, but they couldn't penetrate very far up the Colorado River. So he sailed down the east coast of Baja, rounded the Cape, and then worked his way slowly back up again. Whoops. There you go. Things got very dark at that point. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I must have stepped on the camera or something. Anyway, so he worked his way up and, and made it at about as far. Uh, he went, made it to Cedros Island and then continued north and made it about as far as almost to Ensenada, onto Santo Tomas. Had he only gone for sailing for maybe one or two more days, we would probably be sitting here at the Yoa National Market. But nope, he did it. He gave it up and sailed back. Briefly, the cartography of Baja California was rendered fairly accurately into this map in, you know, printed that year. And then 1541 printed um, an even more rational version by another pilot. So they, they it was pretty quick that the, that the geography got its way into this uh, master chart that the Spanish were assembling. Um, they made one more attempt to get across the four try to get across the Pacific and go back by ocean or the route by a guy named Villalobos. And he left the same year as Cabrillo and didn't work, couldn't figure out how to get across. So, okay, so Yoyoa just gave up that maybe if he hadn't given up, he'd gone a little bit further north, maybe they would have found the route. So whose turn was it going to be next? And they decided it would be this guy, uh, uh, Alvarado, who was one of Cortez's lieutenants, one of the more um, violent-minded lieutenants. And um, he was going to lead an expedition, and the uh, Viceroy of New Spain had seized several ships, including one by this fellow named Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo, who was also a colleague of Alvarado's and Cortez's. Uh, Alvarado was all set to do this when an Indian uprising called the Mixtan War broke out, and Alvarado was killed in a battle. And here he is in this picture, his horse fell on him and crushed him, and that's how he died. So the next guy, in the conquistador hierarchy, who seemed most likely was a guy known for building boats and apparently knew something about navigation. They knew he built the boats because in the Spanish, the final Spanish assault on the Aztec capital, Tenochtitlan, they needed boats to, to do the amphibious part of the battle across Lake Texcoco. They called, they're called brigantinas. You see one of them right here in this picture. And that was built by this fellow named Cabrillo from the guy who built boats. And he worked his way up that piece of hierarchy. He worked, he was helped conquer to Spain. He was part of Alvarado's conquest of Guatemala. And he acquired lands and titles. His name was just Juan Rodriguez to begin with. But there's a lot of Juan Rodriguez. It's kind of like John Smith. So he further um, specified his name by the beginning of the name Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo. Cabrillo being some extinct occupation, like an Escurbelo or Miramuro or something like that. Something having to do with herding animals. In any case, Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo became his formal name at the point he started to acquire stuff. And so he was charged with the job of finding that route. And it, they thought it would not be so hard because, as you can see, you could just go out of New Spain, turn right about where Point Conception, and just right off about where Catalina is, there's Japan, right? Just go a little bit further up, and it's just a hop, skip, and you're over in Asia. So it shouldn't be so difficult. You can only stick with a plan. And unlike a Yoa, just go a little bit further and all will be well, at least so they thought. So off he went in 1542. He had uh, two ships and, and a boat. They, the San Salvador of 200 tons, which was one of the two largest vessels of European build in the area. A Victoria, which was a caravel of 40 tons, and a smaller boat called the, um, the San Miguel which was probably just towed behind the San Salvador most of the time. It was like it's our slurry engine. Um, it's hard to row a big ship, but you can actually get a big ship going fairly fast if you get into a boat and tow it. And that's what the small vessel would have done. Also good for getting into places that were fairly shallow. So they started in this place called Navidad, which is not too far from present day, Montevideo, farther uh, than Navidad. Followed Iola's route very closely, across, they didn't go into the Sea of Cortez, but they went up the coast of Baja, and they say, they found that they penetrated further than Ayoa did and sailed in San Diego Bay uh, in, on September 20th, 1542. Cabrillo spent six days in San Diego, 
that was the minimum necessary to someday have a national monument named after you. So <laughs> we couldn't sign it. Anyway, sailed to San Diego, thought it was a pretty good place. Safe Harbor at that time, this peninsula we're on was covered with coniferous trees. Um, and uh, it was a bit colder and wetter of a climate than it is now. Stayed for six days, uh, made contact with the uh, with the native indigenous peoples here who initially resisted them. Um, you know, like people typically did for any strangers, but after a while they got along, and after a, a few exchanges of hostilities, which the Spanish came off second best in, um, they began to trade a bit, and then Cabrillo sailed off. You know, on his mission, um, he sailed first along all along the uh, Southern California coast. Uh, he sailed over to Catalina, as anyone would. It's we all know it's a fun place to go. So he went over to Catalina, up to San Pedro, which. Complained of the smog, ironically, and then up to this called the Bay of Smokes, and then up to Point Magoo, I'm uh, sorry, Malibu, and then along the coastline between sort of like uh, Ventura and Point Conception. And then he picked a place for his base, and it was either San Miguel Island, Kyler Harbor, or Beecher's Lee, like based on like Santa Rosa Island, to help to try and get around. He made an effort to get around Point Conception. Which, if anybody read two years before the mass, doesn't always turn out well because it's really rough. But then he found a southerly wind in November and had gone all the way north up the coast past the entrance to San Francisco Bay. Now, Cabrillo didn't discover San Francisco Bay because, as it turns out, from any distance out at sea, if there's no bridge there, it's not obvious that there's a bay at all. So, San Francisco actually got discovered by a land expedition in uh, 1770. So he sailed uh, past it, oblivious that there was a great bay there. Went up pretty further north, got into northwest weather again, blew him back down to his base where he died. Now, this stone was found at San Jose Island. It, 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 was, it was reported that he was getting out of his of a boat, a ship's boat, to go ashore to stop an altercation between his men and the Indians on the islands. The indigenous peoples on these islands had pretty large populations, as much as those islands could sustain. So when 150 hungry Spaniards show up, they eat their way through their welcome pretty fast. And that's probably what was happening. He was trying to tamp down um, uh, hostilities. When he tripped, getting out of the boat, there's not really good harbors in many of them. And he broke either an arm or leg or both, or both, both of them, and then died of, um, of an infection of that wound. And, and that would normally be it, except that that wasn't it because the pilot, a guy named Ferrer or Ferrello, took command of the expedition, and they noticed as they sailed around the island that as storms came through, the wind would shift to the southeast from the northwest prevailing winds to the southeast. And they made a trip up to the coast and back again. And then at the onset of the next storm, deliberately went out to sea hundreds of miles looking for a storm because that would drive them to the north, which they thought was the direction of China. And again, the world was colder then, much it was colder than it is now, and the North Pacific was probably stormier then. And so they found their storm and they got just all beat up with it. And then they, they found another one and it drove them probably up to above the latitude of the Oregon border. And that was about as far as they could go. There was no China, it was nothing. So not having found a route to China or any uh, rich civilizations to plunder, they, they, it was time to end. And the ex probably half of them are dead at this point. The leader's dead. The expedition was pretty much a failure. They sail home, uh, and the ships gather again in San Diego and then sail back to Navidad. And the San Salvador is ultimately sent with some of the survivors on a voyage to Peru. This would have been at least her second voyage to Peru. There were probably more where she disappeared without a trace after this voyage. But before that happened, uh, a notary took depositions from the crew and uh, about what they had seen and uh, got the names of places. And even though the log that Cabrillo had hasn't survived, there were notes taken from that log. And so um, uh, it was a, a court notary named Juan Leon that recorded this. And then those notes were lost, but they were made available to a Spanish historian named Antonio Herrera, 50 years later, 60 years later, who uh, made the first compendium of voyages, uh, describing voyages of exploration. And he referred to Carrillo as Juan Rodriguez Carrillo Portuguese. Now, we don't, we're not sure what the name Portuguese meant. Many people think it means Cabrillo was Portuguese. It could also have been a second last name. It was also a code word, Portuguese, was a, a phrase used frequently then to refer to conversos, that was Spanish Jews, 
expelled from Spain in 1542, going to the New World by passing through Portugal, from which they also got expelled. So it would have been Spanish Jews in the New World. So perhaps Cabrillo was one of those. But in any case, um, that's what it said, and that was the sole source that refers to him as being Portuguese. But that information got recorded, and the name that Cabrillo gave to this bay, San Miguel, ended up being on charts. It ends up being there in this Agnesi chart of 1557. And then here, and Paolo Corlani's chart of 1566, you could see San Miguel, a little circle, right? A little circle right? Okay. And Mercator, the famous chart for Mercator, here San Miguel appears on that chart too, and getting ever more like what we're having. And people, the understanding of the world that was unfolding was understood widely. Uh, this was a Japanese map of 1645. Now, the Japanese at this time, we think of Japan as being this in, inward turning, insular uh, culture that had no contact with the outside world. So it was opened up by Commodore Perry in 1854. But in fact, in the latter part of the 16th century and the early 17th century, Japan was much more imperial in its aspirations. They led the world in firearms production. They wanted to take over the Spanish Empire. There was a period in the 1600s where you could have gone to Mexico City and seen Aztecs and samurai and conquistadors all walking around, you know, probably looking for a fight. Anyway, uh, it was a strange world that the, 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 the Spanish knew about this. Anyway, uh, you see it again in this Mercator map, San Miguel. And there it is a little bit more closely. So there you go. Um, that's It appears in the map. Now, concurrently with this, that unfolding sense of rationalism was continuing. Cabrillo's voyage may have been the last one voyage in a world that everyone believed was at the center of the universe because it was actually only the next year that Nikolai Copernicus published his landmark book, Starting the Scientific Revolution, postulating the possibility that maybe the Earth wasn't the center of the universe, that the whole thing that we're looking at would be way simpler to understand if the sun was the center of the universe and the Earth was one of a number of things uh, orbiting it. That was heresy to the Catholic Church at the time, which is why Copernicus published his book. He, died first and then he published it so that he wouldn't get into trouble, I guess. But more and more people were beginning to believe that. And ultimately, that notion of a rational world ends up coming into play with the improvement in navigation and cartography. And ultimately, that route across the Pacific and back was discovered by uh, an explorer named Legaspi and, also, and, and, and um, Andres Urdaneta in a voyage 1564 and 1565. Urdaneta is your picture here was an Augustinian monk, as well as being a sea captain and a navigator, so he had an interesting life. Uh, and he, he pioneered this route, and this is the earliest depiction of it that I know by the Spanish pilot Velasco in 1575, and that's actually the founding work of um, Pacific Oceanography, really, because it showed the route there and back. It wasn't an easy route, though. That route back, you had to go off Japan, where there were typhoons, cross the Pacific at a high and cold latitude, sail across the Pacific to you, hit the California coast, which is often shrouded in fog and gales, sail down the coast to the latitude of Acapulco. So it's much easier to go even to the Philippines, but sailing north was difficult. It took weeks and weeks. About 30 Manila galleons ended up disappearing on that eastbound route. And so the Spanish needed ports to for the galleons to come into. And uh, an explorer and merchant named, uh, named uh, Vizcaino sailed along the coast and he was told, okay, you got, you're going to where Cabrillo had explored and named things, but don't change the names of any places you discover. But it turns out Cabrillo wasn't that great of a navigator, a precise of a navigator. So the names he gave to places, this Cano could not reconcile with the descriptions and their latitudes. So again, he said, well, what the heck? I'm just going to rename everything. So it was he that gave the place we lived the name San Diego. He changed the name of every place, wiping Cabrillo off the map. So all of all of this Cano's place names stayed. Cabrillo disappeared from the map. But the irony is, Cabrillo's name itself is on 1.2 million places in California, and there's nothing named this in California. <laughs> so there's kind of an equivalence there. Yeah. And uh, but this is this is the first depiction of San Diego in a rational way. And this understanding geography continued. Uh, California was the source of some, one of the most, some of those interesting cartographic errors in history. It began to be depicted as an island in the 1600s. This map of California captured by the pirate, Basil Ringrose, shows California as an island, um, which it was thought to be. And this authentic chart, you know, very, very 
Well, I think, you know, very, very well thought of cartographer De Rossi in 1687. California's an island with the Gulf of California going all the way up and it takes it out the top. Now, this, despite the fact that by this time, a guy named Father Kino had walked from, you know, Mexico over to California. So, um, you know, go figure. It, it just did not want to give up this notion of California being an island, which this is 1720. And uh, in fact, it, it, the Cyclopedia Britannica of 1771 refers to California as uh, an island. Okay, it's uncertain whether it be a peninsula or an island, even though there was plenty of minutes by then. So this rationalism was continuing. And it turns out that um, building these ships was one of the most complicated things people had done. And places where this was concentrated end up being centers of, of um, you know, of, of power. So uh, Galileo published this work, which uh, two, he said they called Discourse on Two New Sciences. They were the, the, the founding works of engineering statics and dynamics and everything that he published in his book to describe engineering he described from walking around the arsenal in Venice, which was a giant shipyard and naval facility so when we think about you know uh eight hour days equal pay for equal work and shifts and assembly lines and 24 hour shifts of eight hours each and daycare and managed health care and pensions and stop shop stewards and overtime and all those things we tend to think, oh, that got started with the Kaiser shipyards in World War II. All of those things were present in the arsenal in Venice in the 16th century. And it was the most important industrial complex of its day. And Galileo walked around figuring out how are they doing what they're doing. And he applied mathematics to it. First, got, first engineer that ever did it, and basically founded the whole science of engineering based upon what he saw in a shipyard. And the whole notion of big science continued with an effort to solve that problem for longitude that we saw that how wide is the Pacific, how far across do they have to go? So the first two big science institutions, the National Observatories of Britain, of England, and France respectively, were founded to solve that problem. And some of the most important scientists applied to that problem. And this is mapped by Edmund Halley, trying to determine longitude by magnetic variation. So these lines of variation here, that's the difference between true north and where the compass actually points. Those are the first, that's the first isogonic map ever produced. That is a, a map in which all the lines are the same value. If you use topo maps to go hiking, those are isogonic maps. But Evan Halley, who was, of course, the astronomer who found the comet, was also a sea captain in the Royal Navy, and he was also working on longitude problem. And ultimately, the total, the, the total rationalization of all this reaches its apogee in the Enlightenment with voyages of Captain Cook and the great collections assembled by the scientists of William Joseph Banks, which found, was sort of founded the collections of the National Museum of London. And, and, and this was an attempt to render the, all the world and all the space, the languages in it, the people, everything into some sort of encyclopedic hierarchy in an organizational scheme. And it, that is sort of the height of the Enlightenment. And we start to see where we live depicted in rational terms as we do in this chart or in this chart. And indeed, in the United States, when we get to the 19th century, the top scientific organization in the United States was the Coast and Geodetic Survey. And the maps that they produced were masterpieces of rationalism, right? They were almost a void of stories like you would find in every map. And yet, this is a map they produced. It's the only map they ever produced that has a story written into it, the landfalls of Carrillo and Trello. In 1886, right? So this is a, is a, is a pretty interesting document. Yeah, and again, this was produced by the leading, it was like the NASA of its day. So they began, to, and, and Cabrillo began to be thought of as important because it was about this time that the great fisheries in the Mediterranean and the Bay of Biscay were failing, and there were thousands of Portuguese fishermen who couldn't earn a living anymore. They immigrated to America, many of them. Uh, the ones on the East Coast end up going to places like Nantucket and Salem and New Bedford to fish for uh, big fish on the Grand Banks for cod. And those immigrate to the West Coast, the farmers among them tended to settle in Rio Vista on the Sacramento. The, the, the seafarers, the fishermen, end up settling in San Diego and in, um, in San Pedro. And here, all these Portuguese are suddenly in the middle of, the, of a world where everyone speaks Spanish, all the place names are Spanish. And there's this long rivalry between Spain and Portugal going back hundreds of years. 
and they're desperate to find something on which to last the right day to their home, the ones here. And then somebody gets hold of that book by Antonio de Herrera, who refers to one of these real Portuguese, and bang, they have their identity hero, right? The guy there was their guy with this in California. And it was the Portuguese Americans who elevated Rio to prominence, elevated the story to prominence, and it resulted in that chart. Uh, it also resulted in the celebrations of of Cabrillo's landing in in the uh, beginning in 1892, the 400th anniversary of 450th anniversary of, of Cabrillo's landing. Um, it was a big deal. So San Diego was not an Navy town; it was an Army town. So the Army marched down up D Street, and hundreds and hundreds of San Diegans crowded onto Grape Street Pier to watch Cabrillo row in and discover San Diego. So many people, in fact. The city council and mayor were out on the pier. They collapsed into the bay and dumped the entire political leadership. It would be a great day to reenact some fun. It was popular. Only Cabrillo was rowing in. Cabrillo was rowing in from what? They didn't know. There was no ship there. What was it that he rowed in from? He didn't row all the way from Spain. So the next Cabrillo celebration, they needed a galleon. Galleons were hard to find, but they got, got their hands on a Chinese junk, the largest. Chinese junk called the Alta. And so here's the Alta with Cabrillo wearing a bathrobe with a chamber pot in his head, about to get into a boat to go and discover California. So a true multicultural experience. So Cabrillo is beginning to be this identity figure for San Diego. Uh, and so the next big maritime event that took place was the arrival of the Great, Great White Fleet in 1908, which really put San Diego on the map and really got us to be a Navy town. Now we have all these pictures and medals and things and postcards for that event. And a medal that we have shows Admiral Evans on one side of the coin, struck just for Cabrillo's, and on the other is Cabrillo's flagship. So Admiral Evans, his flagship was actually the battleship in Newark, but that's not what's on the other side. It's the San Salvador one or these Cabrillo. And the San Salvador begins to enter into the iconography. So there was a plan in 1913 to take that lovely lighthouse up there, cut it down. Right, and there'd be a giant statue of Cabrillo, 230 feet tall, following the Statue of Liberty, pointing west. The army really wanted to do that because they were going to put a radio transmitter at Cabrillo's head that would reach all the way to Hawaii. And so they commissioned a bunch of artworks, and this was this was the rendering of San Salvador. And we've continued to see the San Salvador and imagine her, you know, ever since. Even though there was never any picture of the San Salvador, except for perhaps one. Uh, that anyone can know now. So you go to the Point Loma Branch Library and there's a San Salvador as a media center. You go to the Seal City of San Diego. So you see the two pillars of Hercules, right? This is from the Spanish, the Straits of Gibraltar. And you've got the mission, all this stuff. What's at the center? Well, you know, it's the San Salvador in the centerpiece. USS San Diego and LPD-22. What's her crest? It's got the San Salvador in the middle of it. Even have postage stamps, you know? Cabrillo, there's a San Salvador at Cabrillo. Like Cabrillo without his ship, it's always kind of strange. It's kind of like the Hells Angel without his motorcycle. The San Salvador's got to be in the background. Again, all over Balboa Park, these little pictographs on the San Salvador. Um, in, you walk in the, into the, the mezzanine for City Hall downtown, there's a San Salvador sailing in San Diego Bay in 1542. When you go to the Balboa Park and you cross over that bridge, that's the Cabrillo Bridge. And what you see when you look at the top of the bell tower, that's been there for more than 100 years, the San Salvador. So everybody's been imagining for years and years and years. Kids even doing images of the San Salvador. Here's a great one, Manuel Garcia, fine Spanish name. The teacher is, is Vietnamese, I think. And, and Manuel here is from Borrego Springs Elementary, which is a long way from the ocean, but here he is imagining the San Salvador. All these things. And we thought, thought for a long time we had no picture ever of the San Salvador. There was a painting done uh, back in the called Alvarado's First Fleet back in, I think, 1540 that San Salvador was in. It since has gone missing, and I'm kind of hoping it doesn't show up because it doesn't look like the ship we built. That will be in there. <laughs> uh, in any case, then a few years ago, as we were building the San Salvador, uh, we learned of this um, petroglyph out in the um, out in the, in the desert. Uh, and so we formed an expedition with the Bureau of Land Management, the National Park Service, at the time, the superintendent at the time, Korea National Monument went with us. This is Dr. Jim Cassidy, archaeologist. And you have three elements. There's a big thing, a middle-sized thing, and a little thing. We know Korea had three ships. If you look at this, this it looks like a ship. Uh, you see what looks like a yard with a sail on it. 
Uh, there's this sort of thing that looks like horns off the left, which looks a lot like if you see pictures of San Salvador uh, Spritzel. Um, there are things that are vertical, and you can see those a little bit more on this one, but those are the skids, little combinations that kind. And the one to the right, it looks like it's walking on legs, but no Native American had ever seen any vessel be rowed before. All Native American watercraft throughout the Americas were paddled rather than rowed. And generally, when they depict a vessel being rowed, it looks like it's walking on legs. So is this a San Salvador? Well, it doesn't have a caption, so we don't know. It is a ship, and it could have been another, could have been a Yoas expedition. Could have been the Alarcon from the Alarcon expedition to the Colorado. Um, but this is, is quite possibly, um, you know, this is quite, it is quite possibly the San Salvador. Uh, and there's been long running a myth of the ship in the desert, Viking ship or an Andean county or something. I, I think most of those myths have their origin in that image. Um, so is it really a ship? Well, we have a picture, another picture of a petroglyph done hundreds of years later. This is done also by indigenous peoples. This, we know what this is, though. This was a depiction of the first steamboat that they saw go up the Colorado River. And artistically and stylistically, it looked like if the person drew a sailing ship drew that, it's almost as though the same person drawing the steamboat would draw that. So it's, you know, they, people end up drawing impressions of first encounters because all the other things that are typically petroglyphs are typically either anthropomorphs or they are um, abstract geometric designs. That being said, we really couldn't build that and have a Coast Guard crew. <laughs> so we actually needed a real ship. And there were no plans, but there were lots of illustrations. So we drew upon illustrations like this uh, by Peter Boygo the Elder, who was almost draftsman like in his rendering of ships of the period. Underwater archaeology, this one was particularly useful, the uh, Galleon San Juan, which was a vast whaling ship which wrecked in Red Bay, Nova Scotia. Very detailed site report from that. We looked at shipbuilding treatises in the period, like this one by Garcia Diego de Palacio, talking about how ships were built. And this was a little bit after our ship, but we were able to reverse engineer it. And then we had, we didn't have the exact dimensions of since ever we knew she was 200 Spanish tons, but we did find other vessels of about that size, about that time, recorded in Spain um, that did have more precise, more, uh, more fuller uh, description and dimensions. And our naval architect, Doug Sharp, was able to take those, amalgamate them, generate an archetypal galleon of 200 tons, which gradually took form in his program called Rhino and turned into the ship that here's the rigging plan, border sail plan, and the ship that we built. So we ended up laying the keel. Uh, and uh, it was a great, it was a great time, and the ship was blessed by uh, by uh, the matriarchal figure of the Kumeyaay people. And we had all, all the Pacific Islanders there. It was just really a great event. We started building it. And it didn't go smoothly because those frames there, uh, initially the first frames we had uh, laminated for us all blew apart, got epoxy failed. And so we had to go find wood from another source and use a much more ancient technique called double sawn construction by staggered sections called punics. And we built doing these frames. We decided to build a ship at Spanish Landing. Because it's, it's where the California one of our other ships was built. It's a picturesque location. It was big enough. We could put our machine shop under that bridge, people drive over, and it was in public. So, over the course of building the ship, somewhere between 50 and 75,000 people visited the site. And so, it's a great place to build a ship. Uh, we were constantly asked, Well, how are you going to launch it? And I would just joke and say, Well, we haven't figured that out yet. And people thought, He's not serious. <laughs> but we hadn't figured it out yet. So we at one point we're going to take it over the airport and take it down the down the runway, you know, and then back over and use cranes. Um, we it turns out we were hoping to use cranes, but that didn't work for a variety of reasons. And we're going to build ways out into the that water off our island, but that proved to be difficult. So ultimately, what we did was we came in, we elevated the ground with uh, DG, and um, we hired house movers to lift the ship up. Uh, lift, lift the ship up off, off the ground and put her on to a gigantic mega yacht shipyard trailer that was loaned to us by a marine group. They put it on a barge. This barge was loaned to us by this big tug and they brought it in. We, we ran into the shore and anchored it. And then a bridge was designed by Doug and NASCO built it for us. And we put the ship on the, you know, we got the ship up onto the trailer 
you know, we got the trailer over, uh, got it under the ship, got it over the bridge, and halfway across it just stopped. <laughs> I mean, it stopped because why is it stopped? We couldn't figure it out. So we had to call Italy and wait the guy who designed it in the middle of the night. He said, Oh, you need to put more hydraulic fluid in. So we did that and we got him going. We got him onto the barge. And here she goes. We got her onto the barge and, uh, and off she went. Uh, but we still had to get her into the water. So we took her down to Marie Group. And here she is being christened by Ryan McKinney uh, and the Dead Sharp's wife, Carolyn, helping her out. We christened her and then we launched her and we then brought her back to the museum to bring her out. And it was deemed so important a project. Here's the USS Abraham Lincoln. The entire rail is manned by the crew. Pain comes with his head right? You know, you don't believe in that, right? They were leaving to go to Japan that day. They happened to be manning the rail, and we happened to go by. We made it look like it was for us. So, rigging the ship, we had to go through work back to, you know, those royal illustrations because our, our other ships aren't rigged the way the San Salvador is. And figure out, okay, these are, these are these things in the, in the drawings. What, what do they do? How do they work? How does this stuff all work? So we we end up rigging it, not knowing exactly how we were going to sail it. But then we started sailing her. Of course, we had experience sailing the Star of India and California and our other ships. We began to sail her around. We began to produce images like this and like this, and gradually got to be a bit better at sailing her. And, and to date, we have sailed her about, I'm going to say 6,000 miles, 6,500 miles up and down. We've been as far north as Monterey, as far south as uh, Ensenada. We don't have a ship's wheel on board. That's still 150 years away. So we steer with this gigantic, looks like a gigantic joystick called a whip staff, which penetrates through a bearing in the deck at, at your feet and then attaches to the front end of the tiller. And as it goes back and forth, the whip staff actually sinks down further into that bearing. So by the time it's all the way over, you're nearly standing on it to steer. And this is the fine view you have when you're steering. It's the back of other people's legs for the most part. But you can look at the weather edge of the mainsail, and if you're sailing by the wind, or you can look at the compass right in front of you, or you can look at the, you can't see them here very well, but there are Roman numerals carved into the beam above that show the rudder angle. And it's in, it's in Roman numerals because if you recall from a few minutes ago, the Spanish didn't use Arabic numeration at this time. So we, we were surprised that we could tack the ship effectively. Um, when our first set of sails had these big bonnets on them, but when we reduced those in size, because they were really just a little bit too big, and figuring out a spritzel, which most of us had never sailed with. And we also found that at sea, things could she could roll around a, a bit. I've broken a couple of ribs from sailing on the San Salvador, and we, we, we have to watch it because she does have a relatively quick motion. But she is an astonishing thing to look at. And, and actually, in this picture here taken by Mark Albertazzi, she bears an astonishing resemblance to that petroglyph. We see this sort of horn thing in the front looking like the, this crystal. So as I said, we sailed her on, uh, we she goes out every, I believe it's every Saturday from the museum. We take people out, we do away trips. We've done several of those where we're out for sometimes once we were out for seven weeks, going up and down the coast, people can sail aboard the ship on the lakes that we sail on. And, uh, and then when we are in these ports, away ports, we're open to the public and um, to public exhibition. And we've been really a great support from the Park Service. They, we here, I think we have Ranger Amanda here, right here. There she is, see? Uh, and we, and you know, they do the, they do interpretation. We also have the docents of the museums that typically host us. Uh, we train them and they are the ones that really talk to the guests, explain all of the, uh, all of the, the clothing and possessions populating the monks in Al Khazar, how people lived, how they ate, what they ate, what life was like on a ship like the San Salvador. And of course, our docents at the museum did the same for all our visitors. So when you add it all up, the, we initially thought it cost $6.2 million. Uh, the total bill came to about 12 or 13 million. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, what, so it obviously it was way more than we predicted, but fortunately also what was more than we predicted was the contribution by skilled labor, which produced about half the skilled labor to build the ship, and the contribution of the materials. So that's a pretty scary thing to be doing an 11 or $12 million project for an organization that had a budget at that time of $5 million. Our budget is now $3 million, actually. So that is like beyond the realm of what you're supposed to try to attempt. And in the beginnings of the day, I thought, I think that's absolutely true. And we shouldn't have tried to do it. But we built it, and you know she is sailing today. And so the question is, why would you do that? I mean, it's a museum exhibit ship. 
we have classrooms on board, we sail train, we do all those things for that effort. But there's another reason I think behind it, and that I get that to me, it's this reason. That map I showed you that I described as a map of the world, well, maps really aren't maps of the world, they're what's in people's heads. And this is a map of what is in people's head. The thing is, that map never went away. That notion of a world in which everything has been determined from beginning to end, and that we're just mindlessly following a script that's been written for us, powerless, that we don't, we're captives of history, we don't make it or change it. Uh, and that this narrowly confined world that is fractious and violent and appears to make no sense is contained by this horrible sea of death which you dare not cross. Okay, that world never went away. That's in everyone's head. It's in every society's head. It's in every child's head. And to be able to achieve what you need to achieve, you have to cross that line and sail beyond it. And most or most societies have origin stories that explain how to do that. And for us, you know, uh, the one thing that was purpose built to cross that dark, deadly line, sail that cro across that line with the veil, was we think the ship we built the San Salvador. And that's also the end of my story. So thank you very much. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much, Ray. Um, I always learn something new when, when you present, and it's, it's such an honor to have you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, we would like to open the ground up for questions now. Uh, we'll go in between in-person questions, and then we'll uh, go over to our folks joining us on Zoom right now. So let's start with an in-person question. Uh, yes, Gary. Uh, on the original ship, without portholes, run port, you know, the main break. How livable was the interior for Well, you, there's these sort of like tombstone shaped apertures in the Alcazar and in the Foxal. And those, those would have been open. That's above the waterline. And those would have been. You need something to fire crossbows or arquebuses out of. And so you get ventilation through there. But the folks on the Alcazar are, are fairly open. And so those are probably more popular places to sleep when we go sailing and are the areas down below uh, in the, where the, where the, the birthing areas are in the forward part of the ship and in the main hold. Down below in the original ship, though, there's not much purpose in us interpreting that because in the original ship, that would have just been filled with barrels. So up to about 28 inches or so from the deck beams, there would have been one spot that would have been more open because they had a couple horses, we think. They would have been suspended in kind of stretchers um, to be taken to shore and used after the horses recovered, because they don't like being seen that after they recovered, they could be used as mounts for soldiers, you know, because they were important military items. So down below, um, and livable, so people lived on top of those barrels. They, they used mats or something in hammocks. And that's where most of the crew would have lived. But whenever they could scrape together to sleep on top of those barrels. And over time, as you consume the contents, the water and the wine and the, you know, the food, uh, you, you can think about a barrel, you can break it up. And so actually you get more and more room and eat your way down into more headroom. And I'm told on a nuclear submarine, when you set off, they're, they're out for three months or walk around on several layers of canned food. So they eat their way down into the as well. So, down below, you've been living there. It would have been really very little by the wire stairs because there would have been those two horses, and then there were pigs, chickens, and goats, and big mastiff dogs. And people were not supposed to go to the bathroom down in the village. But if you go out and be headed rough weather, you might not come back alive. So we think they did that too. And then, uh, unlike in later, in later centuries of crossing countries where if a sailor died, and they did, in crossing countries, they buried in the sea, you know, they had hammocks by them and they sewed them up in their hammock with a round shot each in and say a few words, nobody go. But on in Catholic countries, it was important to bury people in consecrated ground. So if the sailor died when the ship was on a voyage, they buried him in ballast. So in addition to the pigs, chickens, and the goats, and the mess they make, sailors going down and relieving themselves in the bills, you would have also rotting corpses and meat in those water pits. So it's a fairly aromatic experience. <laughs> we try to keep the new galleon smell going as best we can because we don't really want to replicate everything. Um, but it, uh, it livable, not very much. So I think the sailors, probably as much as they could, were up on that deck. Now, there are a couple gun ports in the bulwarks for the larger bombardettes that we have. They didn't penetrate the ship sides down low like a, a later warship might have. 
So there would have been no ventilation down there because of that. So, so you had one big hatch that you got horses down. And if you open that up, you could get some air down below that way. But that's about it, really. Uh -huh. Then is the ship fitted out in, in its expeditionary sort of partitions? And, and we try to. There, there's, um, there's modifications we had to make past Coast Guard requirements. So there are watertight bulkheads down below, and you don't see those you know, where the coasters go. And be, but because of those watertight bulkheads, we have more hatches because each compartment has another hatch. So there would only be one hatch or maybe two on the radio ship, whereas we've got more of them. Um, but for the most part, there's a few anachronistic elements. There are life rings and fire extinguishers. That's actually what you just have to overlook. But for the most part, we try to have the ship looking like Cabrillo and his pals just went short with another step around, playing around. You know, and that's why those bunks are populated with the stuff that the occupant of that bunk would have rather than put away in a sea chest or something. We'll, uh, we'll go to an online question. Are there any in the chat? So Mark wants to know, was the wood for the ship sourced locally or elsewhere? Oh, it was all sourced elsewhere. And that was one of the hardest things to find the, the appropriate materials because the Coast Guard requires the materials going into the ship be almost flawless. And it's hard to find that in nature nowadays because there aren't as many big trees as there once were. So uh, we got Pat Matak and Black Locust from Maine. And we got the uh, the keel from um, South America. Sapala came from Africa. The um, for the for the lower planking, southern live oak came from Georgia. The fur from the top sides, the decks, and the spars came from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and other materials came from elsewhere. We had to work through providers of those four or five different companies to get us the, all that wood. And um, again, it was difficult because. Um, the Coast Guard required almost perfect wood without knots or flaws in it. And it's difficult to get that much stuff that size that doesn't have any flaws in it. That, did that help that answer the question? How did you figure out what shape the sails needed to be? Well, there's a lot of those illustrations. You know, and they tend to be more billowy, you know, than, than um, the sails of square rig ships in later centuries are. Those bonnets were the size that those would be, but we found that if you're trying to sail on San Diego Bay and you've got this giant bonnet, you just can't see a thing. And um, that's not a big problem in the middle of the ocean, but the San Salvador draws a bit of attention and it's pretty nerve wracking when everybody's like passing in front of you, you just can't, just can't see them. So we cut them down so they're smaller than the bonnets would be. We were surprised that we can sail the ship to windward, and we were especially surprised at how easily we were able to attack the ship. That's changing course by putting it out through the wind. Um, the first time we did it, uh, I told everybody, don't expect this is going to work. It's going to take a lot of try before we figure it out. Go get your hopes up. This is almost, these things were never known for being able to attack well, so we're probably not going to do it. So everybody ready? We did it. She just went about like, you know, well, you set us up for failure. That was pretty easy, you know. So. Um, so yeah, she's we're, we're really we're really pleased with how she handled it. Well, she does say it. Any other online questions? Yes, the next one is what was used before we had pulleys? Oh, that's interesting. So blocks like that, you what we call them blocks on ships. Um, you can find and you have you have evidence of some of those going as far back as the wreck of the Corinthian ship, which is the third century BC. Um, the things we used to tension the shrouds, the parts of standing rigging that are called dead eyes um, on, on Norse Viking ships, it, there is kind of a lever kind of thing. And you tie two ends of it and you, you bend it down and like, like a toggle and tie it off and that tensions that are tied to it. So people have used different things, but that, base, that, that basic table arrangement is one of the simple machines that have been around for a long time. It's probable that the Egyptians used equipment like that to build the pyramids. In the original San Salvador, what was the source of the lines and the cordage? The, the source of lines and cordage. So um, it was it, 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 there were there were that at that time. I think the most common uh, material used for that would have been from the Americas. It would have been some forms of hemp. We still use hemp a lot now. 
that wouldn't have been available to Europeans before that. They would use uh, flag slower and they're less um, but, but I think by this time, they probably were using, you know, are all probably gathering quarters, spinning and spinning the yards and strands and the line using your ends. I mean, were pretty good material, particularly if you can coat it with tar. And then you get tar from pine trees, you, know, you heat it up and mix it with beeswax. And that's a pretty good water approval, weather approval code on all this stuff. Any other online questions? Yeah. Approximately how many volunteer hours were needed to build and fully rig the set okay. That's a really good question. Um, mm -hmm. I had I had I think it was something like 70 or 80 thousand hours to build the ship. So the sense over that we built, it took us five years and we built it with power tools, whereas the original was probably built with um, hand tools and it took about seven months. The ship we build is more complicated because it's got engines, electronics, and we have the Coast Guard and the real was not, didn't have to worry about the Coast Guard. And, uh, and so it was, you know, so it was basically we built a more complicated but also a more durable vessel than the original. The original lasted about 10 years, which was typical, and we would have gone about this trouble for ship for the last just 10 years. But all those volunteer hours, I will say this, it's evident that Cabrillo to build his ships probably used forced labor, slaves, in other words. And we have volunteers that we get paid the same as those guys did back then. Some of them are here. Enjoy it. Yeah. Any in person questions? I have a little story and then a question after it. About a decade ago, we were visiting. Visiting China, and what reminded me of this was the illustration at the beginning of the uh, your presentation, which showed people who uh, encountered giants in yeah. other 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 countries or other admirals. Uh, we were visiting China, and we were touring the city, and uh, we were passed by this young Chinese couple who had come from the inland to this city to be tourists. Also, they were about five foot three, so. They took one look at my husband, who was six foot tall, and asked if they could have a photograph with him in the picture. So there they take the photograph back and tell their, their they, they family, a picture with the giant. there's giants there's <laughs> giants among us. How does one um, become a passenger on, on any of your cruises? Oh, okay, so San Pedro goes out every Saturday on public cruises, and we take 40 people on the ship. So you just go online and buy a ticket if you want. For the longer ones, what we'll typically do, we have not done an away trip for a while because of COVID, so we'll probably do one next year, but our typical routine is to arrange ahead of time with museum, maritime museums typically in ports, and we'll get two or three to host us, and we'll sail up there in their docents that she'll be on exhibit for several days, and, and we'll progress up the coast because sailing upwind is not as fun as sailing downwind, so we'll get as far north as we can, and at which point we will start doing um, legs of, of you know, with visitor with, with guest crew on board. And those will be four days or five days or six days. And typically we will go out to the Chow Islands, you know, and back into the coast. So it may be one leg or two legs or three legs like that. So while we're going up the coast and exhibiting the ship, we're also kind of promoting the, you know, those opportunities to sail for several days. And the people that sell us, they're part of the crew, you know, I mean, they stay and watch and set sails and haul lines. And, you know, we typically will we'll do a unit where we talk about navigation and all about shipbuilding, and we have to teach everybody how to defend ships so we get the guns out and fire those. And, you know, so it's all pretty fun stuff. And um, and and then when we're in these other ports, we also do day sails there, like we do here as well. So hundreds and hundreds of people have had a chance to sail on the ship by now. And, it, and again, it's it's the only early modern era ship I know of that the general public can go sailing on at this point. You can also volunteer and sail crew. You can. You can all find it Sunday, and we will put you to work. And, 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 and part of the deal is you get to learn how to sail the ship. You can sail on ships in four different centuries, you know. And, and so we teach everybody how to do that. That's a really good way to do it, too. So sun, every Sunday at 830 on the start of India, that's where we muster. Also, um, I don't know if tomorrow is sold out, but she's sailing tomorrow with the public. Yeah. And when she sails by, by the way, we contact the monument. We say, oh, we're sailing by. And, and then the rangers, will hopefully, they get a group of people killed together. And we fire one of the guns as we go by. Yeah, it so. always takes me by surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I always, even when I know you're coming. Uh, all right, our Zoom guests. Question from our Zoom guests. I think you just talked about it. Um, 
David wanted you to say a few words about the board of adventure sailings being conducted in the, for the next two and 20 years. So, yeah, yeah. Well, again, our website's a really good place to go for that, you know, and it's got all the dates and everything. And again, we love updating people sailing, and a lot of people have actually gone many times on the San Salvador and in the California, too. We'll typically say the California on a, on a Sunday, San Salvador on a Saturday, usually. So, Ray, what were you doing that you broke the ribs <laughs> that you emphasize? For safety purposes, yeah, the public or crew does be a do really would be a really bad example. So when there's ladder ways that go up in the jam, right? And they're pretty steep, and the headlines you're supposed to hold on to it. You're supposed to hold on to them with both hands, right? Yeah. And not let go if you get to the top of the ladder. Like we emphasize how important that is, right? And uh, uh, never to depart from that routine. Well, I was going up for my watch and I had a can of soda in one hand. And I was holding on one or the other. The ship took a turn and it spun me around. And one of those stanchions that went up just punched through the ribs. Um, it was broke through ribs. So, and, and, and that was kind of a painful trip the rest of the year. So now I always hold on to both of us. Zoom. Greg would like to know can you rent the San Salvador for private events or sailings? You can. We do charters, yeah, and we do we do it for private events for sailings. We can do dockside things as well. We use the ship for filming, you know, occasionally as we do our others. So yeah, all of those are possible. Just again, just contact us, you know, or at the office or on the website. So. Uh, a couple of cool ones. Uh historically, you know, if the uh seasoned the wood before they built it and um how much of uh what components and what percentage had to be imported from uh, europe okay uh well the sapella that we got from which we make uh, the lower planking and uh, uh, components of the rudder and the, the, the beacon and so forth came through europe from africa uh, so it was imported from Europe, but that wasn't where it originated. Okay. So as far as seasoning goes, um, the Spanish probably just went up the river and cut down whatever tree they could. You know, they probably didn't season it. Uh, later on, that was deemed important, particularly with oak, you know, like English oak or light oak. You season it usually about an inch per year. So it could be a long process. You have to think ahead and have a big supply in hand. The framing material we use southern live oak isn't usually seasoned. It does shrink a little bit. It's, it arrives wet and heavy. It's heavier than water. It shrinks a little bit, but it typically doesn't need to be seasoned. In fact, U.S.S. Constitution, one of six frigates built out of Southern Live Oak, the framing was, um, they cut the trees down and they were going to the ship within a couple months. So they didn't see that at all. And that ship's still here. So And her, her original framing is still in the ship too, a lot of it. So, um, but but mostly when you're talking about seasoning things, it's mostly oak that we're talking about. Zoom. Okay. All right, we're good on Zoom questions in person. Ray, what are you working on next? <laughs> My next talk, I guess. <laughs> well, I, I certainly, I don't know. Uh, the, the possi there's a possibility of another big ship, but when I give a talk like this, I'm really hoping it doesn't happen. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's a possibility of that. But we are, we are actually, uh, it, it sort, of, sort of like we're in the process of getting our permits, you know, redevelopment of our museum. So there's a, there's a beautiful building that is that is designed to sort of it's it's like a, a the glass Alba ship parting ways. It's designed by Tucker Sadler and we designed the port side pier next to us, and and it, it kind of evokes the the um, the, uh, the, the uh, convention center. And it's about 7,000 square feet, and it's on a pad out of the water, and ships themselves are all moved out about 100 to 150 feet from where they are now. A couple of reasons, but the main reason is where the embarked area is now, out to Point Loma, that's about a mile and a half, two miles of open water. And in a storm where, where the wind shifts to the west, if it blows really hard, you can develop significant wind waves across that open body of water. They hit the Embarcadero and reflect back. And so out of 100 to 150 feet, it's pretty, it could be seriously turbulent. So we want to move the ships out of that zone 
into calmer water when there's a storm. So that's one thing. The other thing is we're, we're doing the building because uh, you know our ships are all. It's not obvious to people that we're a museum because most people think museums are in buildings, mm -hmm. and so we have a building. We think that that will make it architecturally make it more apparent that it's kind of a museum experience. And it's also a lot of gallery spaces and cafe and a theater classroom and all of that stuff. So it would be more like a conventional museum once we do that. We think it'll take several months just to get permanent. And once we do, it'll take again probably a year to finish the building and finish all that stuff. But that's the next big that's the next big project though. Yeah. Question okay. Yeah. Don't have a question. Apologize. <laughs> the history of the ship, the original ship was just amazing. And then for you guys to go ahead and rebuild this, uh, it, it's amazing. And then to show up to everybody in the community and around the world that wants to see it and to write on it, it's just phenomenal. Well, thank you. That's really cool. Well, there's a lot of people that's really helped build that ship. And so it's, it's a compliment to it as well. It's wonderful. Here, so thank you. Up. Send a DVD of the world talking about this. But I, I did want to, I just wanted to, if you like to read history, mm -hmm. this history, uh, I read a book not too long ago titled 1421. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the year China discovered America. Right. That was Gavin Menzies, right? Yes. Yeah. I wouldn't get too much information for that. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. So, one history. Have you read the book then? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's not got a lot of credibility to it. You know, uh, it, it's so, so, during those voyages, are about as well documented as Captain Cook's are. So that's why we pretty much know where he went, you know, because these were major expeditions and they were well documented and well recorded. And so that was one thing. The second thing is China had had a maritime history of two, 3,000 years. And if you read Gavin Menzies, it's as though Shanghai did it all, right? Not, no one came before him, he did it all. So that's a problem. The third thing is that, so what the, what the Chinese were desperate for was specie. The whole world was running, the world's economies were running on silver and gold, right? And there just wasn't enough of it. Uh, even close. And so when the Spanish discovered the Americas and they um, they discovered almost immediately that they were full of silver and gold, it gave them the wherewithal to trade with China. That was one thing everybody needed. It's almost, it's impossible to believe that as sophisticated a culture as China could have come to America and not, and, 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 and not discovered instantly when the Spanish discovered instantly, because the Spanish were not as advanced in 1540 as the Spanish were, you know, in 1421. This Chinese would have known immediately if there was gold and they would have gone to town. The fact that that didn't happen, it's almost, it, it just, it, it means that, that that particular thing. Now there are, um, there is Chinese material culture that archeologists have uncovered in California and in Mexico, it predates Jinnar by a lot. Yeah, so it's it's almost certain that Chinese seafarers did get to the Americas, but it's um, it's also equally certain it wouldn't have been Jinnar or any part of this expedition. Um, they were trying; they were they had a specific goal. They were going to places they knew about, and they were trying to ascertain those places, determine what was there, what was of value, what they wanted to trade with. You know, they were they were doing it to actually establish trade routes and um, trading relationships with countries that they had knowledge of. It turned out there wasn't anybody that in all those voyages they felt was particularly useful to China, which I'm going to stop doing it by the end of the seventh voyage. Thank you. Sounds like that could be a whole nother lecture. Considering <laughs> <laughs> that. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much, Ray. Thank you, everybody. You all are here at a good time because sunset is happening in about 10 minutes. So I encourage everyone to um, enjoy the, the beautiful sunset here at Cabrillo National Monument. And then the park does promptly close at five. <laughs> so thank you everyone for attending and have a great rest of your night. Thanks, everyone.